broadcast of the Minneapolis Committee of the Whole will now begin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeremiah Ellison. Uh, I'm the chair of the Committee of the Whole. I'll call to order this regular meeting for Thursday, July 1st. I'll note for the record that this meeting has remote participation by council members and city staff as authorized under the Minnesota Open Meeting Law, Section 13D.021, due to the declared state of local public health emergency. Additionally, the city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channel. This meeting is public uh, and subject to the Minnesota Open Meeting Law. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll to verify the presence of a quorum. Council Member Reich. Present. Gordon. Fletcher. Cunningham. Present. Council Member Fletcher, did I hear you? Okay, Council Member Osmond. Here. Goodman. Present. Cano. Here. Bender. Schrader. Here. Johnson. Here. Palmasano. Jenkins. Present. Gordon. Here. Fletcher. Here. Bender. Palmasano. Chair Ellison. Present. There are 11 members present. Let the record reflect we have a quorum. Um, and if any of my colleagues who weren't here want to speak up quickly to be on the record and be present, then uh, I'll, I'll give a, a moment for that. Thank you, Councilmember Ellison. This is Lene Palmasano, and I am also present. Awesome. Uh, and I'm sure um, that all of my colleagues will be on the call shortly here. Let the record reflect we have a quorum. Uh, we have one discussion item on our agenda today, which is the continuation of our budget amendment markup process as a result of American Rescue Plan Act funds. After we complete our markup, we will end with reports of our regular committees that have met this cycle. As you may remember, the Committee of the Whole begun, begun our markup last week by approving three amendments. Today, with the help of our budget office, we have eight additional prepared amendments before us. The technical team will be displaying the amendments on the screen for the viewing public. Today's amendment packet will be added to the file in LIMS once this meeting is adjourned. When we've completed action on the prepared amendments, I will open the floor to any further proposals that were not done in time to be included in the packet. When we've completed all amendments, the budget resolution um, as amended will be forwarded to our next meeting of the full council scheduled for tomorrow, Friday, uh, July 2nd at 9.30 a.m. And so before we jump in, I'm going to see if um, anybody wants to say anything. Uh, I don't see anybody in queue. Um, and with that, we will start with uh, our first amendment, uh, which is from uh, Council Member Ellison, myself. Um, it is a technical amendment, um, and I will ask Amelia Kruver to uh, speak to this. Yes, thank you, Chair Ellison. Um, this was a coding error in our budget information. We had the $300,000 meant for the corridor activation proposal was showing up in public works. So that total was off by 300,000. This amendment would move that proposal to the city coordinator's office who are the, the operating department for this proposal. So this would reduce public works appropriation by 300,000 and increase uh, city coordinators. This is just to clear up an airing in the coding in the budget. Great, thank you for that explanation. Um, I will now um, read uh, the motion um, uh, for the record. So this is a motion by myself, uh, amending the 2021 mayor's recommended American Rescue Plan proposals in the uh, 01330 fund for the public works 
and city coordinators departments, transferring the coordinator activation proposal, authorizing 300,000 in spending from public works to the city coordinator. While public works will be a partner in this proposal, the program, program will be administered by the city coordinator. This will reduce the appropriation to public works by 300,000 and increase the appropriation to the city coordinator by 300,000. Um, with that, I will um, move um, that amendment um, and see if my colleagues have any questions. I'll note for the record that Council President Bender is here um, for this meeting. Seeing no one in queue, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Reich. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Chair Ellison. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That motion carries. Next, uh, we have um, a motion by uh, Council Member Fletcher. Um, uh, and I will allow Council Member Fletcher to speak to this motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I was not anticipating speaking to this, but uh, I will. I'm I'm happy to kick it off unless. Uh, no, you uh, know, I'll uh, I'll read the motion and then um, do, and then. Uh, I I think uh, Dushani Dai is probably the the staff person who coordinated this who could speak to it. Okay. If she's on the call, if 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 not, I can describe it. I am on the call. Chair Elson, uh, Council Member Fletcher, I, I'll be glad to um, speak to this item. Um, you know, as you know, the ARPA funding, uh, the city is hoping to uh, spend, uh, is appropriate the funding uh, directly to the community as soon as possible. Um, we do still have to follow the contracting process uh, outlined by the Treasury uh, Department. Uh, so we don't have the option to not go through the RFP process for any contracts over 175,000. However, we do have the option to, uh, you know, speed up the internal processes within the city uh, city procurement process. And the uh, option that we have come up with is uh, creating a subgroup uh, that would review the proposals forwarded to the subgroup by the purchasing department um, and the subgroup would be consisted of the mayor, uh, the budget committee chair and the finance subcommittee chair and I will also be part of the subgroup and the, the thought is that we would review these uh, contracts and forward to full uh, council for uh, approval or cow for approval. Um, uh, as the designee or the finance officer, I will be authorized to approve these contracts uh, and modify the financial policies accordingly. Uh, thank you, Ms. Dye. I, um, we have a question from Council President Bender. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was just typing in the chat, but um, could someone invite Director Brennan to this meeting? She doesn't have a meeting invite, so she can watch but not join. Um, sorry, there are a lot of, I've been working for the last 24 hours to quickly adjust to the state agreement to end our emergency, the state's emergency declaration and um, working to get an off ramp for our related regulations. Um, for our local emergency. So I wanted to comment that this procurement um, action is uh, in part uh, replaces a procurement authority that had been in place under the emergency declaration. Um, I have a question that might be for Ms. Dye, but also Director Brennan. 
um, as we were talking about the sort of off ramp for our own emergency regulations, um, it came to our attention that CPED has some other types of federal funding that also um, would would be um, better able to get out to community emergency rental assistance, um, for example, that would benefit from this procurement process. Um, otherwise, there would be a delay in getting those funds to their intended purpose. Um, so I don't know what was able to happen between that meeting at 8.30 this morning and now, um, but I just wanted to verify that this motion and the amendment to our financial policies is also going to cover some other federally funded programs that CPED has identified that are share the same level of urgency related to getting the funding out the door. And if needed, we could also, um, I don't want to put people on the spot, so I just, um, we could also potentially bring this back up at the end of this meeting um, if there is need for staff to to talk. I know I talked to, to the clerk and others um, in the interim, but I, I didn't have time to call everyone uh, with all the follow-ups. Madam <laughs> President. Yeah, Ms. Looks Dyer like and Mr. Carl, thank you. Yeah. Mr. Chair and Madam President, I'm sorry I, I was late to the meeting, so I'm not entirely sure that I've caught the entire question, but I believe the issue was around does this motion cover other than ARPA uh, procurement needs in an expedited manner? Um, and as you noted, we did have a meeting this morning. We're still working on refining that. Um, and so I, I believe that this covers the majority of things. There may be a few things we're still working out at the staff level. So to your point about a, a possible slight delay or moving this after, uh, we might be able to confirm that uh, with certainty. Right now there is some, some uh, doubt that this would cover everything. And so uh, I think this would cover the majority, but not all. Can't, can't confirm that. And I see Ms. Dye um, may be able to add some, some additional comments or context. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Ellison, Council President Bender. This, um, this motion is only for ARPA funded contracts, the way it's written right now. What we're working on is tying the two programs that Ms. Brennan needs expedited into the emergency regulation um, extension that might come through. Thank and that's, you, that's what Casey was referring to that we were working on this morning. Council President, did you have any additional questions or? So does it make sense to, to perhaps pause on this item and make sure that it's finalized before we vote on it? I think that's uh, uh, a good proposal, Madam President. I see a, I see a question from Council Member Cano, and then I see Council Member Fletcher, who's the author of this motion in queue. Um, I'm wondering if Council Member Cano, um, do you mind if I allow Council Member Fletcher, uh, who's the author of this motion, to uh, make his comments first? Is that okay? Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Fletcher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I think this conversation does just drive home the importance of the conversation that's been happening over the last 24 hours about creating a responsible off-ramp for uh, the emergency regulations. So, uh, you know, appreciate this conversation. And if we are forced to adapt this uh, to include more because we cannot achieve that off-ramp, uh, I, I support uh, leaving this to the end of the meeting so that we have time hopefully to, to, to get clarity on that behind the scenes so that we can uh, certainly get urgent CFED funding uh, included in the, uh, in, in the ability to speed up uh, our procurement process. Uh, I'm certainly uh, um, willing to put the, to, to pause this conversation until the end of the meeting, but we do have two people in queue, um, Council Member Cano and Council Member, uh, Council Vice President Jenkins. Council Member Cano, if you wanted to make your, uh, your question. 
Yeah, I was curious if either the author of the motion or city staff could help me understand a little bit more about the um, uh, scope of this work. So, um, you know, my understanding is that the city uh, is due to receive $271 million from the federal government. Um, we received uh, approximately half of those funds um, this May or so. Um, so that's roughly $133, $135 million. Um, we know that out of those $133 million or so, um, we have $36 million um, in the unspent category, which I know we'll, we'll be discussing later today. Um, so just curious, uh, are we out of the 97 million that still remain, is, is this ad hoc work group and um, finance officer designee expected to then review the, the $97 million that are still left? Or um, how much money of the $97 million will this particular ad hoc work group and uh, finance officer be um, expected to engage with and review and, and vet? Thank you for the question. Um, I see Councilmember uh, Fletcher, the author of the motion, uh, has a response, and then we'll go to Council, Council Vice President Jenkins. Councilmember Fletcher. Hi, uh, yes. Uh, thanks, Councilmember Cano, for that clarifying question. It's important for people to understand this, uh, that this uh, ad hoc work group is not approving any expenditures, uh, that this ad hoc work group is uh, a, a approving contracts based on allocations made by this council uh, as a way of expediting the process of actually getting the money out the door. Now that is not an insignificant thing. It's important that we look at the contracts and make sure that uh, staff are selecting appropriate vendors. That's part of the oversight function of the council that's being delegated here in this case so that we can move it more quickly. It will shave many weeks off of the process in order to do that, which is why we've uh, chosen to structure it this way. Uh, we did create a, a, a process uh, though, and I, I think it's important that people understand this too, uh, so that if people do have concerns about uh, something coming through, uh, any of the three of us on the work group uh, can raise an objection and send this back to the normal council process. So the idea here is really that uh, we recognize that uh, as a general rule, staff are doing good work and due diligence and know the vendors and contractors who can provide these services and are going to bring uh, proposals forward that we feel good about and we want to help them get money out the door into community to do this urgent emergency recovery work as quickly as we can. Uh, but they are not doing anything that is not allocated as a part of this vote we're taking today. So this is not pre-spending any other money. This is not giving this work group authorization uh, to spend outside of the allocations listed on uh, the ARPA proposal that we are ultimately voting on. Um, thank you. Oh, did you have additional you. questions, Councilmember McConnell? Uh, thank you for speaking to the item around process. My, my question was about the level of monetary uh, review that will be needed. So if a contract comes before the ad hoc committee, the contract will probably say, you know, $500,000 to X, Y, and Z organization to do X, Y, and Z work. And so my question was, is this ad hoc group and the finance officer anticipating to review $97 million worth of contracts or, or how, much, um, how much money worth of contracts? Oh, something just changed <laughs> on this uh, staff, uh, or I, sorry, I was gonna call it a staff direction. Uh, so anyway, if we could just focus on my question first, um, the how much uh, money are we anticipating this group will have to review, um, not make a decision on uh, review as it states in uh, item number one. I don't want to speak for staff, and so if 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 uh, if if anybody wants to jump in, please feel free. But I will say that my understanding uh, from the conversation we've had so far is that. Um, is that uh, the purview is kind of what's up for what's been up for discussion and why we're considering moving this item to the end of the meeting um, uh, so that we can sort of sort out some of the questions that you're asking Council Mercano and then and then have some responses. But I think the I think the, your question about scope is, is is what's is what the discussion has been about so far. Um, but I'm happy to um, uh, be corrected. Uh, Ms. Prover, I see you you've put yourself in queue. Yeah, thank you, I, Cheryl. I, 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 Vice President Jenkins, but figured I'd let you go first. 
Yes, I think I have a short clarification for Council Member Cano. So the um, I don't know what the exact number is. There are some appropriations that are a part of this first $99 million chunk of uh, approvals that we're doing today and tomorrow that are on things like temporary staff um, or, or things that won't be contracted out. This um, work group will be working with just contracts, so it will be something less than the full $99 million, um, but it will be only things that have already been appropriated from Council. That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Gruber. Um, Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Ellison. Um, there's been just uh, a lot of, I think, new language for the public. Uh, for example, e the term emergency off ramp. Can someone um, define that um, for the for the public? I, I can I can jump in and I had actually put myself in queue. Council Vice President also realizing myself that I didn't do a good job of especially explaining for the public where we are at. So um, the night before last, the governor and the legislature reached a deal on in their legislative session that ends the state's emergency declaration today, July 1st. Our city's emergency declaration was initially tied to end uh, at the same time as the state's. Um, we certainly knew that there were negotiations around the end date, but that July 1st date is sooner than was anticipated in most of the conversations that were taking place. So we are having to very rapidly adjust to the impacts of the state's deal on our local regulations. Um, you'll all remember, but for the public, um, we had Mayor Fry declared a local state of public health emergency uh, in March of last year when the COVID pandemic began. And since then, the mayor has had increased executive authority as including um, issuing regulations that are then extended by the city council. We have a number of regulations that are still in effect that would end today if our local emergency ended abruptly today. So I have requested that the mayor call an emergency meeting of the city council today so that we may extend our emergency declaration to create an off ramp, which I borrowed from the state as they were talking about their eviction moratorium ending uh, for the regulations that would have uh, detrimental impacts if they abruptly ended with no plan for phasing them out. There are two main buckets of those. Number one is HR related for our own city staff who had um, sick time benefits related to COVID, uh, both because there are anticipated um, potential health issues related to COVID and because there are things that were in place, um, particularly for emergency responders about when they could take their leave because so many have been working overtime. And those two regulations are in place. They have been um, issued by the mayor and approved by the council um, over the time of the, of the emergency declaration that's in place. And then there are a number of regulations related to businesses, um, adding additional supports or flexibility for business operations as they uh, deal with the impacts of COVID and recovery. Um, and then there, uh, if the emergency declaration were to end um, today with no extension locally, um, all, all bodies that are subject to open meeting law would need to return to in-person meetings. Um, for us, that. Many of us council members would probably prefer to be in person, honestly, but uh, it would also apply to all of our boards and commissions that have been meeting remotely. And our staff needs more time to work out the technical um, technology um, plan to potentially um, host hybrid meetings so that, for example, the council or a committee could be in person, but people could call in from remote either for presentation purposes or to be heard at a public hearing. Um, and uh, we do not currently have a plan in place to continue with televising um, the meetings of the many boards and commissions that have been meeting remotely that would then suddenly not be um, televised. So there has been in some ways more transparency and access to different boards and commissions during the pandemic because so many things have been online. 
Um, so if we extended our local emergency, we would also be able to um, create a phased approach to the return of in-person meetings for all of the bodies, including the boards and commissions, the Charter Commission, Board of Estimate and Taxation, the Police Conduct Oversight Committee, um, and, and all the others. The procurement, there is also a pro procurement regulation in place. This uh, motion is designed to replace that. If if we can uh, design, if we can write it to cover all of the anticipated expenses and funding related to emergency assistance that we want to get out the door more quickly, so that is the relationship between this motion and the conversations that are underway with staff and the mayor about uh, creating a, a less abrupt end to our local emergency regulations. Uh, so. I think I, I'm happy to answer more questions about that. I, I don't want to hijack this meeting um, too much to talk about that. Um, so I, I I do think it would be best to, to take this motion off the table if the author is willing to work out this question related to CPED funding. I also don't want to diminish the really important questions that are being asked. Um, very good questions about how this would work in practice and, and what it would cover and how it would affect um, the spending that we are talking about approving. It also might be more appropriate to do it at the end after we've approved uh, any of the amendments related to spending. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, oh. I, I think I, I guess I think you're you're asking me to wait um, till we get to the emergency off ramp conversation. Um, I'm I happy to answer I could do that, but I'm, I'm wondering does so does this would this still extend the mayor's um, uh, procurement um, realities related to emergency declaration? I think that the the, the or question, this, Council Vice President, if I could, um, I think that there's a lot of questions regarding this amendment, and I think that the um, uh, the discussion so far has seemed to indicate that staff would need at least a few more minutes and before they can answer all the questions. And, and so I want to respect the fact that, you know, uh, the, the author has has asked that we take this up at the end of the meeting. And I think that there are hopefully more more questions are able to be answered at the end of the meeting. Um, but that is kind of what we have on the table is to move this to the end of the meeting so that um, staff can get question can get answers to a lot of the questions being asked. Um, and uh, uh, and and so I think that we should continue this discussion uh, at the after we've taken up the rest of the uh, amendments, if that's okay with everyone. And I guess uh, Council Vice Thank President, you. I think um, just just to be frank, the the mayor had planned to just end the emergency declaration, which would end the procurement authority along with all of the regulations that are currently in place. I have asked to reconsider that and to schedule an emergency meeting so that the council can extend the emergency declaration so that we have the capacity to, to phase out these supports for our staff and small businesses, as well as phase in a return to in-person meetings for all of the bodies that are subject to the open meeting law, including those boards and commissions. Thank you, Madam President. So I would ask the clerk to um, move to the next motion and to bring Councilmember Fletcher's motion back up at the end uh, of the meeting uh, after we've taken up all, all the other items. Um, and I would request my colleagues uh, keep the discussion um, verbal and, and let's try to keep the chat as clear as possible um, so that the tech team can communicate and so that I can see the queue. Um, with that, I will um, move on to the next motion and take this back up after we've completed the rest of uh, our business today. Uh, and so um, we will then move to um, uh, amendment number three, which is um, a motion by council members Cano and Cunningham. And I would um, uh, invite the authors to go ahead and speak on this amendment uh, and I'll ask the tech team to make sure it's up for display and there it is. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll go ahead and start um, and uh, weave together the conversations from last week and, and this week. So as you all might remember, um, we had a very robust conversation about um, the city's plans to address the racial inequities that we have seen exacerbated by the pandemic and uh, by the murder of Mr. Floyd um, through the lens of uh, sexual violence and um, commercial sexual exploitation. And so um, last week we had a really uh, constructive discussion about uh, feedback to this potential uh, initiative. And um, we had a very uh, big meeting with city staff, the mayor's office, council members and their aides um, late last week. And um, you know, myself and, and Councilmember Cunningham had the opportunity to meet and to talk about the intent and scope of this work. And so what's uh, here before you today is an updated and integrated um, proposal to address this issue. Um, so uh, first and foremost, um, you know, I think folks can read this on the screen, and so I'm not I'm not going to read the whole thing, but the focus is um, a citywide uh, plan. Uh, to end commercial sexual exploitation and human trafficking, uh, prioritize, prior, oh, prioritizing the American Indian, African American, immigrant, and transgender communities uh, to be, uh, be sure that we're serving uh, them and engaging them and centering their voices and experiences. Uh, there's a, a three or four uh, bullet points here in the um, uh, amendment itself that uh, correlate and are tied to the uh, blueprint uh, to end commercial sexual exploitation that council members received on Monday of this week, uh, sent out by the city coordinator's office through uh, Sunu uh, Shreta, who does the work on um, labor and uh, human trafficking. So the proposal is $650,000. It's a citywide program available to various nonprofits throughout the um, Minneapolis to help the city carry forward the work of the blueprint, uh, which has been uh, developed and designed for quite some time now um, with the help of community based organizations um, who have uh, done that work for free up until now. Uh, there's been no compensation for them to participate in these programs and initiatives and to help carry out the work. Um, and this conversation is, is much uh, welcomed by them today. Um, I'll add that um, I think some uh, council members, you know, wanted to maybe see this money come out of um, the health department uh, funds that that go to youth, opioids, and safety, and um, you know that didn't seem like a, a good idea to me. And there were no other funds in the uh, proposed package from the mayor's office to specifically address commercial sexual exploitation. So this is um, expressed in its a very explicit, nuanced, um, and connected to the work that the uh, city has been leading on this front uh, for quite some time now. And would um, just, uh, I'll pause here and, and allow other folks to speak and uh, happy to take questions. Thank you, Council Member Cano. Um, uh, Council Member Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just want to um, say thank you to Councilmember Cano for bringing me into this conversation. Um, as I mentioned at our last meeting related to um, our proposals um, that uh, I actually myself work with outreach organizations um, once a week for us to do the work um, on Lowry Avenue North. Um, to do some outreach with uh, women who are uh, in particular who are being uh, commercially sexually exploited. Um, I am I, I, I was um, I am excited to have my name on this work um, because of the fact that it is set up and ready to go. Um, this is not something that would be necessarily starting from scratch. The city already has relationships with many of these organizations and we're building out those relationships. Um, I, uh, much to Council Member Cano's point, um, when I talked to a few of the organizations, they said that they actually essentially, like their funding does not include Minneapolis. And so when they do work, when they do their um, outreach work in Minneapolis, they're doing it for free. Um, which is very generous, but this is really important work that we should not be asking nonprofits to essentially um, do for free out of the goodness of their hearts. Um, we should be investing in these organizations that are doing really critical work. Um, and so, you know, there's there's a, a real opportunity here um, 
to invest in these nonprofit organizations who are doing this specialized type of work um, while also thinking longer term about how are we building out um, sustainable infrastructure to continue this work from the city front. Um, and so I think that um, I do ask my colleagues to please support this um, because I do think that this work is really critical and I am grateful um, to Councilmember Cano's um, being amenable to making this city wide. Um, of course, knowing that we want to be equitable with the distribution of resources. So being mindful of, you know, that there are certain areas in the city in which there's a larger concentration of um, issues than other parts. And so, you know, acknowledging that um, while also holding that there that this that this issue manifests in different ways and shows up in different parts of the city. Um, again, I feel really really good and, and proud to have my name on this work and thank Council Member Connell for bringing me in on it and to the city staff and community organizations and leaders who have been doing this work. I think this is a, a, a very important moment for us to weave all of that together. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, Council President Bender. Thanks, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I just wanted to briefly comment that um, since the last meeting, um, for any of the amendments that I, I knew about ahead of today's meeting, including this one, I've been able to follow up with the relevant staff um, and feel very comfortable and confident that the amendments that are coming forward, including this one, are good governance. They're structured in a way that reflects um, existing work, in this case, a report and sort of action plan related to this issue. Um, and that staff have the capacity to program the funds. Um, so I think the question, the policy question to council members is, you know, how much money do folks want to spend in this round versus saving for future rounds? And then, you know, questions around prioritization. But uh, for this uh, motion, I feel very comfortable that it is grounded again in, in work that has been ongoing and that it is, um, you know, meets the criteria that have been outlined for this round, ready to go um, to support folks who have been impacted by the pandemic. So thanks to the authors and to the staff who were able to provide that follow-up information since the last meeting. Thank you, Council President. Um, seeing no one else in queue, um, uh, I will uh, ask the clerk to uh, call the roll on this motion. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Cano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Chair Ellison. Aye. There are 13 ayes. And that carries, that motion carries. Um, next, we have a motion by Council Member Bender. Um, I'll ask uh, Council President Bender to go ahead and speak to this amendment. Um, and I'll ask the tech team to um, put the amendment on display. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to invite the staff as well from finance or the coordinator's office to speak to this. Um, this motion would increase the total amount of first round spending by $150,000 to um, hire consultants to set up a program evaluation and reporting process that is required by the federal government for these funds. Um, I had asked this question and it turned out that around the same time of our last meeting, new federal guidance was released around reporting. So I think this will set us up well. This small investment, very small as a percentage of the total amount of ARPA dollars that are coming to the city, will set us up to have a consistent reporting structure that will help us meet the federal requirements and also track this spending so that we can 
um, you know, determine what <clears throat> what outcomes we're looking to measure, uh, making sure we have the information that we need to um, to track the the efficacy of the spending. Um, and I, you know, I think this is particularly important because we have in policy, thanks to all of your leadership, um, all of you, uh, you know, created so many. Um, clear policy directions around focusing on race equity, focusing on priority populations and priority geographies. So we really do need to track um, how we're doing and making sure that we can course correct if if possible over the three year time period of the funding. Um, so I think this will help support the staff and all of the departments that are um, programming funding, help inform future policy decisions and support the staff who are administering the funds and responsible for telling the federal government what we're doing with with all the money they were able to send. Thanks. Thank you, Council President. Um, are there any questions uh, um, on this amendment? Uh, Councilmember Palmasano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say I appreciate um, this amendment coming forward and support it um, as is a really good governance measure. You know, we did discuss an audit committee when we changed our entire work plan last year at the beginning of COVID to say what's important now. Um, one of the things that we did was we worked on and discussed how to create processes to track our COVID expenditures such that if they were ever to become available for reimbursement, that we would have all the appropriate records for such a thing. And so um, I did check in with audit about this amendment yesterday. And you know, this seems to be about right if what the Council is going to do is to build structures um, and not complete the actual ongoing monitoring, but um, we had planned to do some of this later down the road, but I think this will really help us in those efforts. So thank you for bringing it forward. Thank you, Councilmember Palmasano. Seeing no further questions, um, I would ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Cano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Chair Ellison. Aye. There are 13 ayes. And that motion carries. Uh, next, uh, we will move on to uh, an amendment um, authored by Council Members Cunningham, Osmond, and Borden. Uh, and I will invite the authors to speak to their amendment. And um, I will ask the clerk to display the amendment. Um, authors, you have the floor. Great, thank you. I'll, I'll kick us off and um, we'll pass it to uh, the co-authors if they're interested in adding anything. So um, this is investing $1 million into our youth in Minneapolis after schools program, um, specifically to be able to address the fact that young people have been the most harmed by COVID-19. They've lost over a year of being in school. Um, they have lost a year of enrichment programming. They've lost a year of mentorship. They've lost a year of connecting in person with their peers and community. Um, and they've lost their a year of leadership opportunities out, out in the community as well. And so we now have um, two different um, city documents um, that uh, actually explicitly call for us to invest in 
creating a youth development fund for the city. So first in our strategic and racial equity action plan, the public safety goal is to create a youth development fund that would invest in closing disparities in high quality out of school programming, um, out of school time programming, um, the disparities that we see. So increasing access in the areas that have um, concentrated violence. Um, and then also uh, at tomorrow, we will be um, likely approving um, what was presented um, to the Public Health and Safety Committee essentially as the work plan for operationalizing racism as a public health emergency. And for their uh, youth related goal, it is to create a youth development fund that would invest in out of school time programming uh, for young people. So this is a priority for us as a city enterprise, but I will tell you, and I'm sure many of my colleagues can speak to this as well, um, that I hear from constituents all of the time. These kids need something to do. These kids need somewhere to go. These kids need adult, more adults around them, caring, uh, healthy adults around them, helping to, to take care of them. And um, this is an opportunity for us to be able to invest in that. So what this um, $1 million would do is that um, it would be allocated um, through the youth coordinating boards. Um, it's an existing um, budget line item that's uh, YMAP, the Youth in Minneapolis After Schools Program, after after school programs, um, and it would be allocated to youth serving organizations in the immediate uh, to be able to invest in, you know, we want to inundate young people with options for, for programs to get plugged into, enrichment opportunities, leadership opportunities, um, and the way that we are going to be able to do that um, is by investing in it and uh, and and you know with the intention of us looking long term as well as to how are we going to create something sustainable but that's really going to be something that we look at through the budget right now we need to get the, these dollars out the door invested in our young people um, and uh, really help to be able to counteract some of the pretty significant harms that have been done onto our young people as a result of this pandemic. So I do ask my colleagues to please support it. There is um, a, 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 an attachment uh, for $60,000 to be allocated to youth outreach workers in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood very specifically because that did exist. Um, Councilmember Fletcher and I included that in um, a budget amendment that we made back in 2018, um, but unfortunately it, it did not make it into the budget uh, for the 2020, uh, or sorry, 2021 budget cycle. And so this is a way for it, and feedback has been resounding that, that, um, that those youth outreach workers have been like really critical in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood. So I am uh, grateful for the opportunity to be able to support bringing that uh, work back into that community. So I will um, turn it over if my co-authors um, are interested in, in also speaking to this. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm happy to answer any questions folks might have. Thank you. I see a few folks in queue, but before we get into that, I'll uh, I'll invite Councilmember Osborne to speak. So there's a moment. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I think that Councilmember Kenny Ham summed it up all. Um, uh, it's very important that that we look into the youth, uh, different challenges they're having. Um, uh, that is the number one issue in, in, in my community that we talked about. Um, kids not having enough opportunity, um, enough uh, resource, um, you know, um, not enough uh, opportunity for them to go. So the kids are just hanging out around. Um, there's, especially in my district, there's absolutely no um, propagation center uh, in the area. Um, a place they can go for homework center, uh, someone who run a youth uh, youth program uh, and a homework uh, center. Uh, it, it, it makes a difference. Uh, one of the programs that I run in my previous organization was 98% graduation and we had four days programming and you know, uh, mentoring kids and making sure that uh, we put in resources into that. It's, it's very important and it will go a long way. So I really 
I want to take the time to thank uh, Councilmember Kenningham um, and Gordon and uh, their leadership to uh, bring this forward, and also the following uh, motion that will that will follow up uh, after this slide. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, last week uh, when we were talking about uh, when I was bringing something up, uh, uh, right now having them uh, uh, work with them and. Um, coming up something together that we a citywide that we can kind of um, address the issue that we all have the similar issue, North Minneapolis, South Minneapolis, whatever you name it. Uh, but collaborating with them, I'm really happy with that. And I also do want to thank uh, uh, President Bender uh, for calling me and uh, really out, reaching out to me on that. And uh, I'm super happy and I thank my colleagues for supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Osman. Uh, Councilmember Tano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to speak in favor of this amendment. I think it's uh, very, very uh, timely and uh, meets um, a very uh, a specific gap that we have heard from various uh, parts of the city. So I'll share that, um, you know, when Councilmember Cunningham and I had a chance to speak uh, earlier this week, uh, we talked about the ability to support young people um, who wanted to stay engaged in um, learning opportunities that might involve arts and culture, uh, STEM and STEAM, um, the science and arts based uh, curriculum that many um, people speak about these days um, with uh, regards to the public school system and, and other educational opportunities. So I'm very, very happy and thankful that the um, the uh, colleagues listed here today were um, had the foresight to bring this forward. I know that we have heard um, the need for this particular kind of investment from folks at 38th and Chicago who are saying that young people um, throughout the pandemic just didn't have places to go and place play basketball, didn't have places to engage with uh, mentors and, and other adults to um, have uh, constructive things for them to, to do to lead them to a better future. We have heard from Pillsbury uh, United Communities that they've had to close down a lot of their summer programming, which is typically um, available on a um, uh, sort of a, a scale. Uh, you know, the, the fee varies depending on your income. And those programs were uh, deeply multiracial and multicultural and really serve the local communities uh, in Minneapolis. And so I think this particular fund will really uh, respond um, appropriately and, and rightly so to, to so much need that we see in uh, places like Cedar Riverside, where we know the young folks have also been struggling with uh, the opioid uh, uh, health issues and chemical dependency issues and, and the moms have been asking us uh, for help. A lot of the um, East African uh, mothers on the Cedar Riverside neighborhood for many years have reached out to us as a council um, to ask for, for support for those young people. And so I think that this is really uh, timely and um, I'm really looking forward to seeing this money uh, get out the door and, and get into the right organizations and groups to um, ensure that our, the kids and children and young people of our community have a more, more support during this time. So thank you to the authors for bringing this forward. Councilman McConnell, Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Ellison. And, um, you know, I just want to say I, I have no, um, no objections with the, the content and um, the, uh, the deep need for these programs. Um, and as it stands now, we are at 1.6 uh, million dollars uh, of unallocated funds, which, you know, I, I, I'm just concerned about the process. And I believe that these programs that are moving forward um, are vitally important to our community. In fact, um, I had a plan to bring forward a uh, a larger package that would address all of these issues as we begin to think about our um, 
you know, how we are spending these unobligated funds, um, as well as the additional $135 million that we still have to program out. Um, so I, I, I will be reluctantly um, supporting these. This goes against all the, the comments, the conversations that we had last week, the reasons why we are even meeting today about this topic. But, you know, that's, that's yeah, that's what I need to say. Thank you. Thank you, Council Vice President. Uh, Council Member Palmisano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I also will be reluctantly supporting this today. Uh, um, I don't, I'm, I'm hoping that one of the authors can help me understand um, maybe why, and I'm sorry, my microphone is messing up, I can tell. Um, I think you okay. There. Um, I feel as though we're creating two different parallel processes here. Um, I'm concerned to learn and maybe this isn't true and someone can help correct that that there will be another staff person added in this one time money um and and that's concerning but i'm i'm wondering why we're putting more money toward a separate organization that's doing the same thing and i'm curious if this has been vetted by the youth coordinating board um, i know there's not a lot of time for that so i appreciate that but why would we not instead put this, add this into the youth community safety fund? Um, I think that, you know, the leader of the YCB and a group could be a part of, could be dealing with applications through that. So I'm concerned that we are creating two different parallel processes that are confusing, that now this one needs its own staff person and that how we would deal with, you know, dual applications in both. Um, I just, uh, it's with lots of reservations um, and maybe one of the authors could help to clarify why we're putting this money into this separate organization that's doing the same thing as the Youth Community Safety Fund money. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Palmasano. I see Councilmember Cunningham uh, has a response. Oh, you're muted, yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you, uh, Council Chair Cunning or Chair Cunningham. I'm used to hearing that. Chair Ellison and uh, Council Member Palmasano. So yes, um, in the next amendment, actually, you will see that the um, Youth and Community Safety Fund is actually being reoriented a little bit so that we have some clear delineation about how the money will actually be used. Um, and so. Um, I, this has not been vetted by the entire youth coordinating board. However, I have been in conversations with the youth coordinating board staff um, about this. Um, and um, this is not creating a, a, a parallel process um, because it, and we'll speak to the second. It was actually originally my intent to have both of this amendment and the next one, but it was an oversight on my part for not combining them. Um, so, you know, we'll speak more to the the next one as well. Um, and uh, the um, what it actually is is that this money will be going to youth development related programming, um, which is more focused on um, you know, what to, what Council Member Cano spoke of, STEM, leadership development, community um, involvement. So, you know, out of after school programs, summer programs, so on. Then um, the youth um, and community safety fund is going to be reoriented to have um, youth and community health. Um, so that's going to be really focusing on prevention and intervention related to health issues. So opioid use um, and other like mental health issues. So really focusing on health. So this is youth development programming. The next will uh, they will also be doing work um, related to youth and community health. Um, the um, youth coordinating board will still be um, supporting the process um, for the um, 
Youth and Community Health Fund, um, they will still be a part of that, but this is not duplicating the processes. Um, I, I do try to be very mindful um, of good governance um, and good governance structures. I'm a, I'm a bit of a systems nerd, and so, um, so this is not duplicating any processes in the uh, with that. So um, I think I may have answered the question. I hope I did. Um, and uh, so I will turn because I see that there are other council members in queue. Uh, council member Palmasano, I just wanted to make sure that you didn't have any additional questions or or responses. Nope, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, council President Bender. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to briefly thank the three authors for working together to bring forward these two proposals um, after some discussion of uh, some separate but very similar um, interests in supporting youth. I, I do think that there is a need to increase the total amount of spending dedicated for youth support in this round of ARPA funding. Um, I, you know, I know I, I, I'm not sure it's really fair to kind of compare um, what's in the mayor's proposal versus what council members are adding. I think some council members got very specific things added into the mayor's proposal. And and I think this, I frankly think that this is a gap that, that I support filling. Um, you know, I think we've talked so many times, so just very briefly, you know, I think watching our youth through this past year, um, I don't think our community has come together with enough support for young people and we see we see it every day. Um, some of you, I think more than others, and I know how much all of the council members have been working in, in community and and um, you know even personally trying to support the young people. So I just think this is so urgently needed. I am not one of the council members who's been directly serving on these coordinating board or otherwise sort of more directly involved in the programs that we have existing for, for youth, but I do appreciate very much that the three authors came together and worked together with staff in the different departments that touch this work to come up with a joint proposal. Thanks. Thank you very much, Council President Bender. I put myself in queue, uh, but before I make my comments, I wanna just say uh, that uh, Council Member Goodman has had to step out for agenda setting for another committee. Uh, so if you do not hear her uh, in the roll call, that is why. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, um, uh, I believe, you know, last meeting there, there were a lot of amendments that did not come uh, ready uh, that were using uh, unallocated or unobligated un funds. Uh, and I, I think I remember saying in the meeting that I don't, I don't mind how much of this money we spend, whether it's all of it, whether we preserve all of it, uh, but that I was concerned that without all of us being able to see um, uh, uh, the amendments beforehand and without being able to know for certain whether staff had done their due diligence, uh, that that was really uh, driving the main concern. We certainly passed um, the amendment, uh, the one amendment that was prepared that did have staff support uh, that did use unobligated funds last week. And I think that that's why, um, you know, this is an inconsistent uh, with how we treated the items last week. You know, these were all prepared ahead of time. Um, and that if and that if once we get through these these amendments, if there were unprepared amendments that again were using unallocated funds, then 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 the antennas I think for all of us would go back up. Um, and so I think it's really the matter of uh, the amount of diligence that we've all been able to see and share with one another um, uh, that was driving the extension to this week, um, not purely the use of unallocated funds. So uh, I just wanted to make that that comment. I see that we have. Um, Councilmember Cano in the queue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to briefly share uh, my perspective on process. And I know that some council members have felt uncomfortable with the speed and um, the process of allocating these funds. I just wanted to share a little bit about why I don't have any um, issues with this process. Uh, typically when the mayor proposes the budget, the council members get to amend it, approve it, or um, deny it. 
Um, this is the same process we're following here now. Uh, this isn't new. This isn't odd. This isn't strange. This is how we do the work together. This is the checks and balances of the city. Uh, the mayor and his team working with staff have put together a recommendations. We are now digging into them, making changes, addressing the issues that we feel, feel must be reflected in such an initiative. Um, I also feel that, you know, having $36 million of unspent funds, knowing that we're going to still have to tackle a city budget in August and December, and we're going to have uh, likely uh, uh, the second half of the ARP dollars coming in next uh, spring, uh, that it is appropriate for us to uh, get this money out the door, understanding that communities right now are struggling to pay the rent, artists are out of work. Um, you know, many of our cultural centers have had to uh, shut down. And so uh, <laughs> I would say that it would be amazing if we would have had another $2 million amendment to invest in the arts and cultural work um, in the way that, um, you know, Council Member Gordon and um, Osmond and, and Cunningham got together to really vision about the money that is needed in, in the youth um, uh, population of Minneapolis. And so right now, as it stands, out of the $271 million that the city uh, will receive uh, through the ARP funds, only $500,000 of those have gone into arts and cultural work um, at the city and in Minneapolis. And so I, I do feel like we could have done more and we could have really um, met the moment, uh, but I understand that uh, you know time is, is limited for people. So I, I feel really comfortable with all of the amendments that we have approved today. I don't think we have uh, a separate process. I think this is how we integrate the vision needs and a variety of requests from um, many of our constituents and residents. Um, and this is also a time to respond. Uh, I feel um, a sense of discomfort knowing that we are still gonna be sitting on $30 million, knowing that there's people in our community right now that need to figure out how they're going to pay the rent, how they're going to put food on the table, how they're going to transport their kids uh, to the locations they need to go to. Um, and and you know, restaurants are still struggling to figure out how they're gonna stay uh, afloat in um, uh, you know, our cu cultural and commercial corridors. We know that many of our um, cultural centers have had to shut down and not provide services services and, and programs and events. And some of that is coming back, um, but we know that the racial inequities have deepened over the last 12 months. And I think that allocating these funds quickly and using our expertise um, as council members who have been at least together now for four years, uh, really leaning on that work and understanding that for some of us, our work is engagement every day. We have meetings every day. We talk to community groups every week. And so I, I want us to really um, recognize that asset-based knowledge that we bring as policymakers and not pretend that we have to reinvent the wheel every time there's a budget. Nothing's gonna change in 45 days. Well, knock on wood. Um, and, and so again, in 45 days, when we take up the conversation about what to do with the $30 million that are left, uh, I think some of these issues are gonna be the same. So I just wanna really help us all to acknowledge all of the hard work that we do every day, that we are in daily community engagement conversations, weekly community group conversations, and that that's the work is to feed those, um, you know, the, that sort of constellation of uh, feedback that we get through text, email, phone calls, community meetings, um, and put them into these uh, budget amendments. So again, really happy to support the uh, Cunningham Gordon Osmond Amendment and um, I have no issues with the process. I think we're doing a good job. Thank you, Councilmember Cano. Um, Councilmember Gordon. Thank you very much. I just wanted to speak to the motion a little bit and I did want to clarify um, that there was not the intention to add a staff position and um, just got confirmed from uh, the director of the YCB that there is no staff position being added with this. Um, not that we could not maybe use more staff, but that isn't part of this motion here. I also want to point out I've served on the Youth Coordinating Board for a long time and out of school and after school programming has been a focus and we've been watching decades of deteriorating funding from the state and other levels coming there. And I also feel like this is one area where we really fell short during the pandemic. I think in our concern to make sure that everybody was safe, that we were separated, we cut off programming across the board from our youth. And that was especially a mistake in terms of our 
at risk use that we have in our city. And I think it makes absolute sense that we now are using this rescue and recovery funding so that we can build back youth programming, especially where we can play a bigger role in out of school and after school programs to help address that and even adding some outreach so that we can get people connected to that and our youth connected to um, positive activities and, and putting the right track. So appreciate the discussion. Um, and I, what I just said about this could apply to the next motion coming up too in terms of how we need to bring resources to our youth and I won't necessarily have to speak again, but I appreciate everybody's support. Thank you so much, Councilmember Gordon. Um, I'm not seeing anyone else in queue, and so if there aren't any further uh, uh, questions or comments from my colleagues, um, I will um, ask the clerk to call the roll on this amendment. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Cano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Chair Ellison. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That motion carries. Uh, next, we have um, another motion by our, our, our very busy trio uh, of Council Members Cunningham, Osmond, and Gordon. Um, and so I will allow them to speak to this amendment um, as well. Seems to be related to the, to the last one. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, it was it's my apologies. I meant to combine the two. It was an oversight on my part. Um, so uh, this is, and, and again, I will pass it over to my colleagues uh, to be able to speak to um, any specifics that they would like to um, talk to. Um, so this is just clarifying uh, the division of, uh, so the Youth and Community Safety Funds, kind of a conglomeration, um, trying to, so this is to help create some more clarity um, in addition to the one million dollars specifically for the youth development fund related work so um, what we're looking at doing is taking this um, taking this bucket of money and dividing it up um, and so uh, we're looking at putting one million so this is the original amount it was 1.75 one million dollars going to a youth and community health fund to help clarify um, for their uh, that it's going to health related work, um, both youth and community need, um, related health. Um, that's why it's in the name. And then uh, 500,000 of that um, original amount then going towards um, the youth violence, or I'm sorry, the violence prevention fund in the Office of Violence Prevention. We already have a mechanism for that. We've had it for a few years now. Um, we already have a lot of um, community based organizations that are doing violence prevention and intervention related work on the streets, boots on the ground um, to be able to get more money out to them. And then 250,000 of that to go towards group violence intervention technical assistance um, because we are implementing through um, investments um, in, in the, these ARPA proposals, um, a new version of group violence intervention, GVI Junior. Um, and so being able to have uh, national technical assistance to ensure that we are implementing that with fidelity um, to make sure that we're getting the best outcomes. Uh, in, in working with uh, council members Osman and Gordon, um, there has been um, an additional $500,000 invested in um, to this particular appropriation um, with 250,000 of it going into the Youth and Community Health Fund um, and 250,000 of it going into the Youth Violence, Pre or, sorry, I keep saying that, Violence Prevention Fund um, with both of those buckets um, being uh, Specially geared towards cultural districts um, to ensure that that we are um, getting equitable investment um, across the city in both health and um, public safety and violence prevention and intervention investments. So um, 
this is just to kind of help clarify and, and build the right systems. And I have been in conversation with health staff. I have been in conversation um, with the necessary stakeholders um, related to this. And so we're, we're all feeling really good about it. And uh, there's a lot of opportunity for some really big impact here. So I will um, open it up to see if my colleagues, uh, my co-authors have anything to add. And I see some folks maybe are in queue. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councilmember Cunningham. Um, I actually don't see anyone else in queue. Um, and so um, with that, with no further questions or comments from my colleagues, uh, I will, uh, uh, the, the amendment is before us and I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Osmond. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Cano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Aye. Jenkins. This particular. Aye. Chair Allison. Aye. There are 13 ayes. Particular and motion carries. And so I think um, this particular fund will really. There's um, some feedback going on. If somebody could, if you could mute their microphones, great. It's ending. Um, and so uh, we have uh, one more motion, uh, and then we will take up um, the the motion that we. Um, we were discussing earlier by Councilmember Cunningham, by Councilmember Fletcher, uh, but right now we have a motion by Councilmember Cunningham, and I will invite Councilmember Cunningham to speak to this motion. Um, and uh, yeah, please, you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you. I've been very busy the past week and a half, um, and so uh, sorry to be taking up so much space today. Um, but this is the last thing for me. So. Um, very excitingly, the health department um, did receive a half a million dollar grant um, to address the um, request um, that was in the original mayor's proposal um, around community health. Uh, I'm sorry, community food needs. So um, based on the conversations that I've had with um, various food shelf um, operators that the demand that they've experienced from COVID-19 has been so vast um, that uh, they're having a hard time maintaining operating costs. Um, it's like they're very inundated and it's hard for them to um, like it's hard for them to keep their doors open essentially um, because of the fact that the demand has been so significant and they can't um, they're not exactly gen generating revenue from it, so they're having a hard time. So, um, so what I am doing through this amendment is essentially um, taking off the additional parameters that were on the original um, proposal and um, having it be all available for operating costs um, with food shelves and distribution systems um, and, and really concentrate those in, in Minneapolis food deserts, the, the investments in the, those areas. So um, this is just kind of taking off some of the parameters and, and, and helping to guide um, operating costs in specifically in food deserts. So um, with that, Mr. Chair, I'll pass it back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions uh, for this amendment? Uh, not seeing any, I'll first say that we've been rejoined by Councilmember Goodman as evidenced by the last roll call, I believe, but I forgot to mention that. Uh, welcome back, Councilmember Goodman. And um, with that, I will ask the clerk to please call the roll on this amendment. Councilmember Reich. Uh Gordon. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Cano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Chair Ellison. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That motion carries. 
Uh, with that, we will go back to amendment number two uh, by Councilmember Fletcher, and I believe that there is um, a revised version of that amendment, um, but I'm happy to be corrected. Um, Councilmember Fletcher, please uh, yeah, take the floor, please. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I'm aware that staff are uh, working to make amendments. They put one draft in front of me just a few moments ago that I was not comfortable with. Uh, and so I'm not sure that I've even seen the language that is up on the screen. The public is seeing the sausage making process in real time where council members names are added to procedural motions generated by staff when they are the chair or in this case, the finance subcommittee chair. Uh, and I will ask the staff who have been working on this to speak to the current status of the motion, particularly in relationship to the concern I raised over email 10 minutes ago. All right. Um, thank you. Mr. Council. Chair, I'm, I'm also happy to help, um, you know, talk through this or answer any questions after staff maybe kicks it off. Thank you, Council President Bender. Um, I see that the motion. And I think maybe at this point, Mr. Carl, I don't know, he's multitasking as we try to work with the mayor's office to finalize an emergency meeting for today. Um, but maybe Mr. Carl will be the best to speak to this. All right, uh, Mr. Carl. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam President and Council Member Fletcher, uh, we're working to put together a process that started with uh, funding that is coming to the city through the American Rescue Plan Act, all of ARPA. Uh, which has been the primary focus. And the original motion was delegating to the city's finance officer or designee, the purchasing de department division director, uh, the authority to expend those monies within policy parameters that are set by the mayor and council in order to expedite the release of ARPA funds to um, community organizations directly. So it really um, minimizes the time that normally would be spent uh, through the council's process through delegating that authority to the city's finance officer. Um, and our intention was to provide a working group composed of uh, elected officials, the mayor's office, and then uh, from the council, the chair of the council's finance subcommittee under the policy and government oversight committee and the budget committee. So that those three elected officials had um, an oversight of the work by the staff to review and approve those um, expenditures and the approval of those contracts. If there was any disagreement by the elected officials with the staff's decision making process, it would allow those contracts to be elevated and put into the council's normal decision making process through its standing committee system. So that was a check. Um, it would also allow another check, which is that the uh, finance officer and the procurement division would prepare a weekly report, which would be received and filed through the council's regular process for public notice, accuracy and trans or access and transparency so that there was still a public record of the expenditure of those ARPA dollars, even as we were expediting the um, process of getting the funding out to the community. So I believe in the draft that was before the council, um, number two, which is listed as American Rescue Plan Act, that process is clearly delineated that the council is establishing that ad hoc work group that I um, described. Um, and that that group consisting of the mayor and those council members chairing the uh, finance subcommittee and budget committee would be the members of that ad hoc work group to oversee the work of the finance officer and designee in approving and expediting ARPA contracts. Each week, the procurement division would prepare a weekly report to the finance officer de detailing all of the ARPA contracts that are to be recommended for approval. The finance officer would review that list with the work group before final execution of any of those contracts. With the work group's approval, those contracts could be expedited and completed, and then a full report would be filed uh, with the full city council. So that's the process detailed for ARPA funding. This morning, um, there were some additional concerns about the ability for the CPED department or I should community planning economic development department 
to uh, expend dollars, not necessarily tied to ARPA, but federal funding monies that are uh, allocated to the city for the purpose of really addressing rental assistance, mortgage assistance, and emergency response to homelessness. These are through the forms of federal emergency rental assistance, ESGCV, and CDBGCV fundings. So similarly, the process that staff wanted to mirror here was a delegation of authority to expedite the approval of those funds and the execution of any contracts or expenditure of dollars from those federal programs very specifically tied to those um, federal funding sources and the purposes of those sources, and that that would be done by the finance officer also in conjunction with this work group that we are creating um, for the ARPA dollars. So really, I think here we haven't crafted the motion, but the intent is that these federal funds that are coming through to the city for these very specific and prescribed purposes related to ARPA or related to rental assistance, mortgage assistance, and emergency response to homelessness tied to um, those federal dollars that the city receives uh, could be expedited by um, waiving the normal council process, which can take up to a month and saving that time by having a staff expedite that work with the oversight of that working group composed of the mayor and the two council members I mentioned. So um, working to uh, correct the draft motion to show that all of those funds are subject to that process. Uh, and uh, I believe that perhaps CFO uh, Dushani Dai uh, might be able to answer additional questions about that. Um, also, I believe Director Brennan from CPED is on the call and can also speak to those needs with respect to her department. Um, and of course, the attorneys who have been uh, working with us furiously to bring this draft motion forward. I think I'll stop at that point, And I know Council President Bender, who's been involved, might have additional comments to provide some context. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Carl. Uh, I, I I have a question and a potential resolution, but uh, bef but before I ask my questions, I will uh, call on Council President Bender. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, so I th I think the clerk just described the change that Councilmember Fletcher was referring to, which was. Um, to ensure that all this whole bucket of money was subject to the committee process with the, the reporting back to the council as was described in part two, but not in part one. Is that correct? And my understanding is that someone is writing in a, a revised version of this now. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, I realize that this feels less um, complete than some of the other work items as we all work together to react to the uh, various um, elements of this process. I do want to say that, you know, for the last year plus, we have been under a pro procurement regulation which gave significant authority to the mayor to approve contracts that would normally go through the council process. So normally contracts over $175,000 go through the council for approval um, or authorization for them. Um, so what this does is maintain some level of um, expedited procurement process for the federal dollars. Um, but it's more narrow to, to just those funds than the existing regulation has been. And it includes this report back mechanism. Uh, we had been getting brief reports on the procurement, um, which are included in each of the COVID reports from the mayor. So you can go back into LIMS and see, see those um, written verbal reports, uh, written reports, and some of them are verbal. Um, related to the procurement regulation. So I think there were really good questions earlier about the amount of money that this applies to, which is a very significant amount of money. And the um, you know policy question about how much authority do we want to give to staff um, to, to spend the money versus our normal process, which brings out you know a lot of this through council separately. I think given 
the urgency of the need in community that there that there is a strong case to be made for uh, expediting the spending. I feel comfortable with the check points that have been put into place with this. As one of the council members that was involved in reviewing all of the hiring waivers in 2020, it's actually a significant amount of work. Um, so I appreciate the council members who are in the chair roles of the of the budget and finance committee being willing to put in that time. I, I trust those council members to flag anything they think would need to come to council for approval. Um, which is how the process is laid out. If any of the members of the group say, hey, actually this needs more explanation, this needs more public scrutiny, this needs more time, that would come to council as it usually would. So that's my take on this. I certainly don't want to um, discourage any questions. Um, and I think, you know, at this point, that would probably be best directed to the to the staff who would who've, who've requested and would administer this approach to spending. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council President Bender. Um, I have a question for the clerk. Um, um, and it's maybe uh, kind of a technical question. And um, I also just want to say uh, uh, for the public, I, Mr. Carl has is I'm, I'm witnessing him balance two very different items, very complex items in real time in our email here. And so we should all commend um, the clerk for, you know, um, uh, his focus and attention to these details. Um, and uh, I'm wondering because the language has been adjusted so recently and because the author um, of the amendment is still making determinations about um, uh, their approval of this of this language. Is there any way that we could do essentially the equivalent of forwarding this without recommendation and, and resolving maybe some of these issues and concerns um, before uh, by tomorrow? OK, um, so I'll, 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 I'll I'm not going to propose that yet because I see that the author is in queue, um, but I just wanted to articulate that and um, and pose it as a potential solution. Uh, but with that, I'll call on Councilmember Fletcher. I was in fact in queue, Mr. Chair, to make exactly that motion. I, uh, I, I, I think that's the right thing to do. I want to uh, give myself uh, a chance to review the proposed changes to the language. I want to give uh, staff the opportunity to get the details right on this because it is very important. We are talking about delegating uh, procurement authority even with some more checks and balances than we've had on that during the state of emergency, this is still something we should take seriously and make sure we get right. And I don't think it's possible with the kind of last minute changes. I'm not going to pretend that I've had a chance to review and ask questions about the changes that have been proposed while I've simultaneously been in this meeting. Uh, so yes, I am I, I am moving that we uh, forward this uh, without recommendation to council tomorrow uh, to give everybody uh, 22 additional hours to figure out what we think about this. Thank you. Um, uh, Councilmember Fletcher, I um, I agree that this this is complex, but it's also incredibly important. Speed in this process is important, but but so is accountability. Um, Council President Bender, I see that you um, you're in queue. Happy to second the motion. I think it's a good approach. I I just just want to say that I, I would encourage council members to ask questions about this either now or in the interim. I think it was important to bring this today and have this discussion because it is a significant decision. And um, I think important to not just bring, you know, directly to council. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know if we have heard, we heard a bit from Ms. Dye earlier. Um, I guess I would just say if there are any kind of specific questions now, it's maybe worth asking them here in this context as you know, and then certainly um, take it up for tomorrow's meeting. And then I did want to say, I think we're close to um, an agreement with the mayor to bring for him to do a call for an emergency meeting. We had hoped that that would be starting soon, but I, it's going, it, there needs to be an hour notification. Uh, looks like the clerk has an update about that. Um, and, and part of that decision is about the procurement regulation that is in place, but ending today, absent action. So maybe to be continued to both of those meetings as we think about 
the procurement uh, processes. So before we take up this motion, I will call on uh, the city clerk, Casey Carl, and professional juggler. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted, while, while we're in a public forum, I did just send uh, the mayor's call for a special emergency meeting at 1230 today to all council members. Our communications department will be uh, circulating that to all local news media. But because this is a public forum, it's a good opportunity for us just to announce that publicly. And we'll put that out through social media and also our gov delivery channels. Um, because of the emergency nature of this, there is not um, a longer notice requirement uh, other than making good faith efforts. So announcing that during this meeting, which is a public forum, is another uh, means for us to say that in approximately an hour at 1230, the city council will have a special emergency meeting, at which point to take up consideration of a resolution that would extend certain uh, emergency regulations promulgated by Mayor Fry during the declared state of emergency. Uh, a copy of a draft resolution uh, authored by Council President Bender is included with that call uh, and we will be uploading that to LIMS for public access right now. Um, thank you Mr. Carl. Um, really appreciate that announcement. Um, and so with that the motion to forward amendment number two uh, without recommendation is before us. I'm not seeing any further questions from my colleagues, and so I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll on that motion. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Cano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Chair Ellison. Aye. There are 13 ayes. And that motion carries. Uh, and I want to thank everyone for the discussion that we were able to have on that motion. Uh, that concludes um, all of our prepared amendments for this meeting. Um, I will take a moment to see if any of my colleagues have any additional amendments that they were hoping to uh, bring forward. Not seeing anyone uh, put themselves in queue. Um, we've all learned our lesson from the last meeting. Uh, so I'm grateful for that. Um, and so with that, we've concluded this committee's work on the 2021 budget revisions related to funding from the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, I will move approval of the general appropriation resolution as amended to the full city council for its consideration at its regular meeting uh, scheduled for tomorrow, tomorrow, Friday, July 2nd. Uh, and may I have a second to that motion? Second. Second. That motion has been seconded. Is there any discussion? Um, is there any final discussion? Uh, I'm I'm putting myself in queue, um, and I I apologize to do this to my colleagues. Uh, I'll keep it pretty brief. Um, uh, you know, for the sake of moving the meeting along uh, well and and smoothly, I wanted to make sure that I made this motion. Um, uh, but I also do plan to vote against this motion. Uh, and I wanted to be able to explain shortly why I don't have some big speech prepared. In short, I, I, I think that um, uh, this process was incredibly fast. A couple of my colleagues have noted that. Uh, Council Vice President noted that. Um, and um, that being said, I think that um, the proposal wasn't, we were not able to um, vet it quite enough um, uh, for it to be a, a document and, and for it to be a plan that really serves uh, the public, uh, in my opinion. I think that every single one of the amendments that my colleagues brought forward uh, has improved the mayor's uh, ARPA funding proposal. Um, um, but in a process where we are looking at $99 million plus, um, uh, where we usually have the entire fall to review, late summer and fall to review, um, you know, uh, uh, change items that, that will often amount to, 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 this, to this amount. Um, I felt like the process was incredibly fast um, and I, I commend all of us for doing our best to 
um, uh, make it work. Uh, there were some hiccups along the way. There were some disagreements about how we should proceed. There was a lack of clarity about the process as we were making it up as we as we went along and, and tried to have some accountability as we went along. Um, but I uh, just wanted to explain that to my colleagues and to the public. Um, and uh, I'll see if there's any further discussion. Uh, I don't see any, and so I will ask the clerk to please call the roll. Council Member Reich. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Cano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Chair Ellison. Uh, no. There are 12 ayes and one nay. That motion carries and the revised budget proposal will be forwarded to the City Council uh, this Friday, tomorrow. Um, finally, we will receive reports from the standing committees on matters to be considered by the full council this Friday. Uh, we will begin with uh, the Biz Committee, Business Inspections, Housing and Zoning, uh, chaired by Council Member Goodman. Thank you, Council Member Ellison. Uh, the Biz Committee is bringing 15 items forward for approval tomorrow. Items one and two have to, well, item one is the Malcolm Yards. Um, uh, on sale liquor license and entertainment. Item two is a land sale. Item three is a land sale for the Satori Boutique Apartments project in the fifth ward. Item four looks like a whole bunch of, I'm not sure if you don't read through it, but this is a huge deal. This is our Minneapolis Homes Land Sales and Financing Awards. This is 62 homes that are going to be sold to with a, a preference agreement. Uh, and also many of the homes are net zero as well as others that are Energy Star certified. A lot of this money is going to BIPOC developers in the community. This is one of the largest land sales and financing awards we've done for single family home ownership for people of color in the city. So it's a big deal if you haven't had the opportunity to read the report, I think it will really um, be impressive to you. Item five are the liquor license approvals. Six are the renewals. Item seven are the gambling license approvals. Item eight is the designation of Minneapolis Workforce Development Area 10. Item nine is a contract with Minnesota Valley Action Network. Actually, that's item number nine. Item 10 is the Hennepin County TOD applications and 11 is the Workforce Development Board appointments. Item 12 are the summer grant applications for the Met Council's various programs, TOD and livable communities. Item 13 is a rental license reinstatement. It's notable because this was a Steve Friends property. And item 14 is also a notable rental license reinstatement. This was a former Mahmoud Khan property. Item 15 is a rezoning. I'm happy to answer questions on items one through 15 that will be in front of us tomorrow. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman. Are there any questions on the committee report? Seeing none, I uh, will move to um, receive the report from the Policy and Government Oversight Committee, uh, chaired by Councilmember Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Ellison. I'm trying to get my camera on. There it goes, I think. Um, the Policy and Gover Government Oversight Committee um, brings forward, um, let's see, 13 items today. Um, item number one is the appointment of Davis Sensman to the Transgender Equity Council. Item number two through four are various requests for proposals. Item number five is a legal services contract with the Department of Justice. Item number six is a contract amendment with Riverview Window Inc. for lead hazard control. Item number seven is a contract with um, Canopy Mental Health and Consulting to provide professional services to operate a 24-7 um, 
mobile uh, behavioral health crisis response team. And I do want to note that that is a very significant um, development in our efforts to uh, develop alternative responses to armed police officers. Item number eight authorizes a grant acceptance from the Graves Foundation. Item number nine authorizes a memorandum of understanding with Hennepin County Human Services and the Public Health Department. Item number 10 directs the Division of Race and Equity to work across city departments to implement a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I also want to note the historic nature of that, um, of this process, uh, the, the formation of this commission, and um, really just want to thank all of the uh, participants on the trans, I mean, I'm sorry, on the Truth and Reconciliation uh, work group, uh, some of whom uh, presented at um, committee yesterday and, and really want to commend their efforts. I will speak more to this tomorrow. Um, item number 11 is grant acceptance from the Metropolitan Emergency Board. Item number 12 returns to author for, um, I'm sorry, to the author an ordinance related to the Public Safety Charter Amendment. Item number 13 is a resolution opposing the Enbridge Energy Line 3 Tar Sands Oil Pipeline. Um, I will stand for questions, but I also just want to thank uh, Council Member Fletcher for um, supporting me in chairing the uh, first half of the uh, Policy and Government Oversight Committee yesterday. Thank you, um, Council Member Fletcher. I'll stand for questions. Thank you for that. Are there any questions uh, on the committee report? Seeing none, we will move to the Public Health and Safety Committee chaired by Councilmember Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Public Health and Safety Committee is bringing forward three items for approval. The first is accepting a grant from the CDC uh, for about $4.3 million for a two year period to address COVID-19 health disparities among high risk and underserved, underserved populations. Item number two is authorizing an extension, extension to a grant agreement with the Minnesota Department of Health um, related to enhancing influenza vaccination coverage. And then item number three is um, passage of a resolution amending the um, declaring racism as a public health emergency um, in the city of Minneapolis um, and then adopting the update that we had um, related to that resolution as the implementation plan for the resolution itself. Um, I am happy to answer any questions related to these three items. Thank you for the committee report. Are there any questions? Seeing none, I will move us to the Transportation and Public Works Committee chaired by Councilmember Wright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the committee will be forwarding 21 items. Uh, item one is the Storm Water Management Program Annual Report. Item two is the Truck Parking Ordinance. Item three is the 2021 Alley Renovation Program. Uh, items four and five are both contract amendments uh, for work of the department. Items six through 14 are all various agreements with outside entities to uh, be part and parcel of approved work of the department. Item 15 is the National Association of Transportation Officials uh, uh, Pandemic Response Recovery Grant uh, for 18th Avenue South Little Earth Transportation Study. 16 is the Minnesota Green Corps Program and is the application for Green Corps members for the 2021-22 program year. 17 was sent forward without recommendation. Um, and it's the environmental impact statement draft purpose for the 252 I-94 project. 18 is the bicycle advisory committee appointments as listed. 19 likewise is the pedestrian advisory committee appointments as listed. 20 is the skate day block event for June 24th. And 21 was the bid for downtown East Street reconstruction project. Uh, Mr. Chair, I stand for questions. Thank you, Mr. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Uh, Councilmember Wright. I um, real quick will speak to the uh, I-94-252 amendment. I will be bringing some amendments to the draft purpose and need uh, tomorrow. And so I'll make sure that my colleagues um, have a draft of that. So thank you. Seeing no further questions on that um, committee report, we will move to the audit committee chaired by Councilmember Paul Masano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There is nothing that audit committee needs to bring to council this Friday. Our audit, audit committee met this week and went through usual items of business like auditor updates, revisions to the schedule of the work plan. Um, but very importantly, we received, filed and published the police department's field training officer program audit. Um, so just if to say, a couple brief words about that because uh, I think it's of great interest to a lot of us. These recommendations um, that come out in this audit report, they focus on transparency, both to our first responders on how they should expect to be trained, but also to the public on how they should expect to be served. They focus on mental health and wellness, especially for those tasked with training a new generation of officers. You know, we continue to ask more and more of our officers as we face a staffing shortage. And this is felt especially hard in the FTO program as trainers are asked to train more officers than they have the capacity for. So, um, you know, I think this maybe highlights that we cannot continue to lose good trainers to burnout and rely on people less qualified to then fill, uh, backfill that. These new guidelines um, that could go into place with these new guidelines that could go into place, we can continue to reshape our police department to fit the vision of procedural justice and equitable service that Chief Arredondo has laid out. So combine, combining these recommendations with the mayor's recruitment push, I think we will be able to make improvements um, in our training about the kinds of values that we wanna see in this department in an entirely new generation of officers. So I'm very excited about the results of this audit. I'm glad that this is linked in the um, in the schedule and the documents, and I look forward to continuing the work to see them become a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Palmasano. Um, I see we have a few questions uh, from Council Members, uh, and so I will start with Council Member Gordon. I don't necessarily have a question. I did want to express my um, gratitude to the audit committee for looking at this and digging into it. I think the field training officer program has been um, an enormous problem. Um, it's unfortunate that we can't maybe get a better review of the report, but uh, I, I, I suspect we could bring this to a committee. Um, and I'm of a mind it might be great to have more transparency and lights shining on it and opportunity to um, gather input and strengthen it and have it be a city policy so that we could influence this program and make sure that it does well to the future. But um, that said, I think it's fantastic that we're getting this um, done. We're going to be able to look at it. People can see it and, and we have a chance to really, I think uh, if we can leverage all the will that we have to improve things, improve this um, FTO program and make sure that it um, is much more effective than it has been in the past. So I appreciate that. I look forward to digging into the details and seeing real results coming out of the police department. Thank you, Councilmember Gordon. Councilmember Schrader. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Allison. Uh, I also just want to thank the, the audit team and audit staff um, for doing this report. Uh, I do want to point out to my colleagues there are uh, I, I would take the time to read the report. It is missing um, some key th things, like it has been over a year since the World Watch uh, field training off former field training officer Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd. Um, the uh, report does not get into what led up to that, what failures of supervision um, and discipline led to that action. Um, it also does not talk about how we are going to stop that from happening in the future. Um, it's also unfortunate that this has taken over a year um, for 
um, the city council to get rec. Well, actually, since the city council can't take actions on um, MPD, it's unfortunate that the city can't see what recommendations would be there. Um, but that said, um, while I wish there had been more proactive action, I'm very glad that we have the report now. Thank you, Council Member Schrader. Council Member Fletcher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and uh, uh, thank you to Councilmember Palmisano uh, as chair of the audit committee for bringing this uh, forward. I'm really glad that the audit committee is looking at this. I was, uh, you know, it's it's funny how two people reading the same report can draw different conclusions because I, I would not have characterized this as a, uh, a sort of positive recommendation about transparency and wellness. I thought it was a fairly damning report about uh, the failure uh, of our city to create a structure, to create standards, to create oversight, uh, to create a process for filing complaints if there were problems, uh, to create consistent expectations of what this FTO program is. It's a critical part of our training and uh, our audit team did an excellent job of exposing significant process flaws uh, that really reflect a failure of attention and a failure of implementation uh, of of this critical function of training uh, by our chief and our mayor, uh, going back many chiefs and many mayors, right? This is a program that that uh, just really has not um, uh, been been held to account or or been given the structure and supervision it would need to be successful. And that's literally why we have our audit committee is to identify places where there are process gaps in our city. Uh, this clearly is one, and I think it's very important that we understand it as such. I would encourage everybody to read the report because it's very explicit in very dry technical language. It's it's not a uh, um, dramatic page turner, it, 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 but but in very dry technical language, it's very clear uh, that our uh, processes are lacking. Uh, it makes recommendations that I'm hopeful will follow. That I know. Uh, uh, the mayor and the chief communicated their intention to make improvements moving forward. Uh, so I suppose we can find a note of hope in that, but I think it's important that in our role as audit committee, uh, we hold up the real uh, uh, findings of, of uh, challenges and problems uh, that exist within the FTO system. And this was very important work and I'm grateful to the audit team for bringing forward a very clear headed, precise, accurate uh, description of uh, a program uh, that uh, is in significant need of improvement. Thank you, Councilmember Fletcher. Seeing no uh, further comments, um, I will take those as comments and, um, and thank you all. Um, that completes our work today. So without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned and uh, see you all shortly at the emergency council meeting. Thank you. Yeah.